to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, unlike most of the other lessons, I'll touch on an interesting opening, the Rui Lapa's Yanish Gambit, named after a famous great player from over a hundred years ago. This gambit is very rarely played among top players, although I have to say that Grandmasters Rajabov, Skvantnichev, Ivan Sokolov and Aronyan, few others, use it definitely time to time as a surprise weapon. It's an interesting opening and if your opponent doesn't know what to do against it, it definitely can give you some good games. Also, even if your opponent is well prepared, like opponents of Rajabov, for example, was in many games, he still gets a very interesting game, so I certainly can recommend it as a fun opening to have as your opening choice. Well, let's see how it starts. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop b5. The game we will be analyzing, the main game, is being played in the recent Women's European Championship between Monica Sachko and Victoria Schmilit. Black plays f5. That's the Yenish Gambit. Obviously, it's a temporary pawn sacrifice, but... Uh, White usually does not accept the pawn because then black would have very good control of the center. The most common and best regarded move always has been white playing knight c3 in this position and then the main wild and crazy variations start with pawn takes, knight takes and then d5 and then white makes moves like knight e5 sacrificing the knight and then capturing on c6 and so on. However, that's not what people play in recent days. After knight c3 in this position, uh, Shmilita, for example, who played this game with black that we're seeing in a different game, responded with knight f6 simply, not capturing on e4 and going for those wildness. Then in that game, white continued with d3, she captured on e4 and actually reached a pretty similar game as we shall see in our main game analysis. And the bishop would show up on c5. Let's go back. In the main game that we're seeing today, white played d3. As I said, after knight c3, I suggest knight f6, which reaches rather similar type of positions as we will see d3, pawn captured on e4, white captured back, and black just plays knight f6, putting pressure on the pawn on e4 for now. And white castled. Now, of course, capturing the pawn immediately on e4 would not be a wise idea, because white immediately could play rook e1, for example, and get a very strong position. Black played bishop c5, which is the correct move. This position has also been reached between the world number one player Magnus Carlsen against Rajabov, who is probably the biggest expert of this variation on the black side, where Magnus played queen d3, which not only protects the pawn on e4, but immediately sets up a trap preventing black from castling because then the bishop would be hanging after queen c4 check. Of course, Rajabov didn't fall for that, but played d6, which is a natural move, not only protecting the pawn on e5, but also protecting the bishop on c5. And then, White's idea was to play queen c4 to literally preventing black from castling. However, that's only a temporary prevention. Black played queen e7, came knight c3, and here, in fact, black decided to castle on the opposite side of the board by playing bishop d7, preventing the future 
trade on c6 and then the necessary pawn doubling on the c5. White continued with knight d5, knight d5, pawn takes, and knight d4. Trade, trade, knight trade, and bishop trade. In fact, in the game, the knights were traded first on d4 and then the bishops on d7, but it doesn't make a big difference. And now white played a4. with threatening to trap the bishop with c3 and then b4 and then a5. So black needs to make space for the bishop with a6. Bishop e3, forcing the exchange of the bishops. Of course, capturing on b2 doesn't look very good because the bishop would be pretty much trapped after rook b1 or rook a2. Pawn captures back and black castles to the queen side. And this position is pretty equal. Black, of course, needs to hurry up and occupy the f-file with one of his rooks before white would do so with the second rook. Rook af1, queen e7, and the position is equal. This is a game you can look up in databases if you choose to. Game between Magnus Carlsen and Rajabov played in the famous Morea Linares tournament in 2008. Going back to this early stage of the game, White in the actual game we're uh, analyzing decided to accept the challenge and get the pawn. Bishop took knight, the beat captures back and White captured the pawn on e4. It would be pretty suicidal for Black trying to maintain the material balance with knight e4 because that would allow the white queen to appear on h5 and cause black a lot of trouble after g6 and knight g6 and so on. So in this position, black simply castles. Now it's clear that black has some advantage in development and now also the pawn is hanging on c3. White in this position typically protects that pawn by either playing knight c3 or pinning the knight and indirectly protecting the pawn with bishop g5. The game that we look at, white just played bishop g5, but before that I'd like to show you a game that was played between the reigning world champion Vichy Anand and the same Magnus Carlsen who we just saw that didn't reach any advantage against Rajabov on the white side of this opening. I guess he liked it that much that he chose to play it on the black side against Vichy Anand just a few months later in the Grand Slam final in Bilbao in the same year in 2008. That game continued with knight c3 and then black plays d6 sacrificing a second pawn, but after knight takes e6, queen e8, black would be happy with the position. Knight retreated to d3, bishop d4, threatening now to trade on c3, and then the pawn on e4. Anand played knight e2, and the bishop retreated to b6. Now white still has an extra pawn and protected it on e4 by pinning bishop g5. Black gets out of the pin, renewing the threat on the pawn. White must trade in order to get a chance to protect the pawn sufficiently with knight g3. And actually this very same position was reached in another game between Magnus Carlsen on the white side and Rajabov from Monte Carlo in 2007 and in that game uh, black played bishop a6 but the improvement of Magnus himself on the black side of the same position was queen f7 putting pressure on the pawn on f2. White responded with b3 with the idea to be ready to meet if black would choose bishop a6 
c4 to ignore Black's bishop attack on the knight on d3. Therefore, the bishop has no reason to go in that direction, and uh, Magnus moved the bishop to e6, simply developing it, and to clear the 8th rank for the rook to go to f8. White played queen d2, followed by rook f8, keep pressuring on the pawn on f2, rook a to e1, and rook h6. Now the plan is to play queen f6 and then queen h4, which is pretty unpleasant because it threatens to checkmate, obviously. And if the h-pawn advances, then the g3 knight is gone. History. Therefore, Anand played queen c3, preventing queen f6. And here, black had an interesting idea, playing queen d7, protecting the pawn, and not only protecting, but also preparing a very interesting idea of bishop h3, followed by then capturing on g2 and queen h3. This uh, arguably was better than uh, black's move in the game, which was going back with rook f6. And here, black went back with the rook to f6. And in this position, white probably should have captured the pawn on c6, but instead made a mistake by playing rook e2, most likely overlooking the cute trick bishop e3, which now traps the rook on d2. Of course, after pawn takes, rook f1 checkmates. A very interesting game by two of the very best players of our times. Let's go back to the other game that actually we are analyzing to this position where white chose rather the indirect protection of the pawn with bishop g5. Now the knight is pinned and therefore the pawn on e4 is protected. Game queen e8, very typical move, getting out of the pin and renewing the threat to the pawn on e4 and, of course, at the same time, the knight on e5. There is only one way for white to maintain the extra pawn and that is to trade on f6 and then retreat the knight to d3, which attacks, in turn, the bishop on c5. Now black chose to move the bishop to d4 on purpose to provoke the c3 move. Because once that c2 pawn moves up, ideas of bishop a6 gain power because the knight on d3 is less protected. In another game between Vichy Anand, the reigning world champion, against Rajabov, the specialist of this variation, uh, in uh, the Morea Linares tournament in 2008, White chose to play knight d2, not playing c3, and then came bishop a6, pressuring the knight and indirectly the pawn on b2. Anand played the unpleasant looking rook b1, and Black had a pretty okay position after d6, c4, Black played c5, b4, and the usual pen, putting pressure on f2 and c4 now. King h1, rook f8. And after f4, black won the pawn back and equalized the position. Let's go back again to our main game, where white indeed did play c3, chasing the bishop back, and then developed the knight with knight e2. An interesting other alternative for white is that's worth to try is to play e5 and then to play knight e2. But let's follow up with our game where white played knight d2 immediately. And here in a number of games black have played d6 and uh, then developed the bishop and so on. But black came up with a an improvement over those games and played d5 immediately offering a trade between the pawns 
And the idea is that if pawn takes, then not to recapture. But black has a very elegant move, namely bishop h3. Now, if pawn takes, black wins the piece back immediately after the fork and queen takes knight. Now, even though white is a couple of pawns up at the very moment, the white king is in a very delicate position and black has a very good compensation for the pawn. On the other hand, if white does not capture the bishop after pawn takes and bishop h3, but for example, tries to defend with knight e1, then the idea is quite brilliant, rook g6, and if king moves out of the pin with king h1, then beautiful move, queen e1. If queen takes, then check with bishop g2, followed by immediate checkmate. Or if white captures with the rook, then black has a choice between immediately repeating moves with bishop h3 and then back to g2, or give a check from f3, capture the queen, and then capture the pawn with a still playable endgame with equal material. I'd like to also point out though that after bishop h3 and knight e1, rook g6, king h1, queen e1, white is not forced to capture the queen and may capture the bishop instead, but again black has an equal position after the resulting endgame. The game here after d5 continued with white playing e5. And this is an interesting crossroad where I'm sure there are some players who would prefer to keep the rook out on the 6th rank to help the attack against the g2 or h2 points. But in this game black rode the rook simply back to f8 and resulted in a pretty good game. White answered with king h1, natural move moving out of the pin, and black played queen g6. That's where the queen belongs, attacking the knight. If now white would protect the knight with queen e2, black's response would be bishop g4, forcing a weakening with f3, then bishop f5, chasing after the knight, and queen h6 with a very nice position for black, despite the extra pawn for white. After queen g6, white started to make a series of inaccurate moves by playing knight b3. It's a move that strategically looks very nice, trying to occupy the c5 square. The problem is tactics. Black plays bishop a6, pressuring and pinning the knight, so if the knight moves to c5, which probably is still the best choice at this point for white, then black would trade and then capture the rook on f1. In the game, white played rather passively, hanging on to the extra pawn and protected the knight on d3. And now it's exemplary how black created a beautiful attack. Rook f5, white played queen d2 and rook a to f8. It's beautiful to see how now all the black pieces are coordinated and attacking white from every angle, especially the f2 pawn. White played a4, trying to trap black's bishop, but black acts very fast. Played rook h5. Now, quite amazingly, if white would play a5, there is a brilliant move, queen g3. That would cause white a lot of problems, thanks to the back rank weakness that white has. If instead white would try to do a fork with knight f4, then the problem is the counter pin with queen h6. The game continued with white playing rook e1, getting out of the pin on the f-file so the queen g3 threat 
no longer may work. And now Black played another brilliant move, Rook FF5. The trick is a bit hidden, namely that if White now plays A5, can you figure out what was Black's plan? A beautiful, brilliant move, Queen G3 again, even though the pawn can capture but then rook h2, followed by rook h5. Absolutely brilliant. The game continued with white playing h3. And now continues in an energetic and brilliant way, rook f3. Although queen g4 did the job as well. Knight f4, queen h6. Pinning the knight, but sacrificing the rook, followed by a second sacrifice. If now king moves out, rook h2, checkmates in just a couple of moves. Therefore white had no choice but give up on the queen, but black wants more. Black wants to win the queen under his own or her own conditions. King g1, queen g3, using the pin, followed by bishop f2, threatening checkmate. Now white had no choice but to avoid that, giving up the queen. Another fork attacking the rook and the pawn. White continued with knight b3, queen captures, king g1. And now that all has cleared out, black already is doing very good, but the main thing is that the white king is still under attack, under pressure. And white will lose further material. With this, this strong move, bishop e2, the threat is queen g3, followed by bishop f3 checkmate. White still tries to prevent that, but cannot for long, because after bishop d3, bishop e4 is unavoidable, and then white will have to give up the rook, and reach a completely lost position. A beautiful game, and maybe this game inspired you to play the Yanish Gambit. It's definitely a very good surprise weapon, and as you can tell, even after Anand and Magnus Carlsen prepare against it, they have difficulty in refuting it. And finally, let's see the Jewel of the Week. In this position, white has the material advantage, but black has a whole bunch of pawns running down the street, and many of them are real close to the promotion square. So unless white figures out a good game plan, black will win. As usual, I suggest you take your time, take about 5 to 10 minutes, try to figure out how to make this work, that you either catch all the pawns running or do something else. And the solution is knight c6, a2. If now knight c2, then white could not stop all the running pawns. But the correct move is knight e5. But this allows the pawn to get promoted. Well, that's certainly true. But if pawn promotes, white plays knight f3 and amazingly creates all of a sudden a checkmate threat which black cannot really stop. What would on the other hand happen if after knight e5 black realizing this would move his king? Well that would give sufficient time for white to catch all the pawns. Knight c2 and then knight e3. All the pawns are caught, blocked and then all white needs to do is move the king out of the way of the c pawn and then promote the c pawn real quick. A beautiful endgame composition by Lake. Thank you for listening and see you back next week. Bye-bye.